Hey, Boaz here with Next Pittsburgh, and we are here at the Pittsburgh Botanic Garden for another installment of Yinzer Backstage Pass. We are going behind the scenes of their apiary with beekeeper Dan and beekeeper Joe. And so first step is to smoke up. Smoke you to try to get a little bit of deterrent for the bees getting too active. Sort of like barbecue cologne. Okay, Annie's getting some smoke treatment also. And so this just makes the bees less interested in that? The smoke kind of stimulates a genetic response in the bees that um, tells them, well, maybe the forest is on fire. We should get busy making sure the hive's secure, maybe engorging with honey, and just makes for a more pleasant experience for both the bees and the beekeeper. So what is step number one? Step number one is we have this uh, repellent called Fisher Bee Clip Quick. I'm going to apply this to what's called a fume board. And, you know, generally more the better. It smells kind of like almond extract, so it has kind of a pleasant smell to us but the bees don't like it, and they move down in the hive. So there are bees. You can see there's some bees on there. Dan's gonna smoke them to calm them down a little bit, remove the inner cover, then I'll place the fume board on top, and that will drive the bees down in the hive. Yeah, gosh, you can see all the, what are those, the slats called? This is called, these are called frames. I'll just pull one out real quick since the bees are cooperative. Okay, so we're pulling out one of these frames, and oh my gosh, it's just packed with honeycomb. There's the ripening honey, and we're going to take this back and harvest it. All that capped honey is good honey. Generally, to harvest honey, you want about 80% of the cells to be capped like this. That indicates to the beekeeper that's the right moisture content, and it's going to store really well and spoil. And so I, here's the one thing that always confused me about this process. Are some of these cells like filled with baby bees also? So we have something called a queen excluder here. See this little piece of plastic in between the supers? So down here is the brood chambers. That's where the queen bee is. She's held down here by the queen excluder. She has a larger thorax and she can't move past the queen excluder. So they're just worker bees up here, but all the young bees should be down here. You know, there could be, I'm gonna, I'll know once I take it off, but there could be 50 mm -hmm. pounds of honey in just this one hive, which would be almost a five gallon bucket full of honey. Okay, do you think they've gotten their fill of this Almondy scent. I think it's time. We're going to take this off. So, Dan, I'll hand this to you. If you could just put this fume board on, and I'll carry the honey super over here. We got most of the bees off the honey, but you can see there's a couple dozen in there still. So, Dan's going to blow the last few off. So, we take as few back to the honey house as possible. We want to leave them here in the apiary. We don't want to take them off site. What the bees put in these top boxes belongs to the beekeeper. That's the beekeeper. And whatever they put in the lower boxes, that's for them. Bees at this latitude need 60 to 80 pounds of honey to make it through the winter, and the beekeeper just takes the excess, what the bees produce above and beyond what they need to survive the winter. What are these bees eating around here that's turning into the honey? Probably our big four nectar sources in the spring would be black locust, tulip poplar, blackberry, raspberry, and some years basswood. This will be a wildflower honey and be a mixture of everything that bloomed this spring. Gosh, how cool. It's just sort of this time capsule of what's been flowering over the past few weeks. It's super cool because each hive is different. I have four kids and each have their own hive and the honey is different. They get different amounts, different colors, different flavors. So we'll never get the same honey again. It's and unique. I, I got to take, take this back a second. All your kids, you have four kids and they're all beekeepers also? Yeah, so they, they help out. We're bottling honey. They, they share their honey at the State Farm Show. They've all won blue ribbons at the Pennsylvania State Farm Show for their honey. Gosh, congratulations. You must be proud. Oh, yeah. I'm glad they... That's a little, good family project. I feel like I should do a little interview with the bee. How has this experience been for you today? <laughs> and how are the bees doing these days? I mean, I feel like we've been hearing a lot yeah. about hive collapse. So I've been keeping bees since 1976, and it's definitely more difficult to keep bees than when I was a boy. But um, with intensive management, I've got lots of bees. You can see the, these bees at the Botanic Gardens are doing really well. It just takes a higher level of care, mainly because of that parasite Dan alluded to earlier, the varroa mite, and um, not only weakens the bees by feeding on the bees, but also um, transmits viruses. So we're treating for the mites today at the same time. And are these mites like microscopic? Can you see them? No, they're pretty big. They're about the size of a sesame seed. Oh. So they're surprisingly big for a mite, but they um, do a lot of damage to the bees, not initially, but over time. Left untreated, if you do nothing to manage for the mites, in North America right now, the average lifespan of a hive is about 18 months. So now where are you taking all these frames that you took out? I have a honey house at our farm where I extract honey. We just finished doing our crop. So first I'll take a hot knife, remove the wax caps to open up the cells, put it in a centrifuge and the centrifugal force spins the honey out. 
and then you collect the honey at the bottom, run it through a coarse screen to get out any big chunks, and then goes right in the jar. Pretty pure, natural product. Gosh, well, thank you so much for showing us around. This was awesome. Great. Nice to be here. Beautiful day for it. Yeah, we're going to go check out some more of the Pittsburgh Botanic Garden. And now we're meeting up with Keith here, who's the executive director of the Pittsburgh Botanic Garden. Thanks for having us. I'm glad to have you here. It's really exciting to always show uh, first timers or return visitors um, what's happening at Pittsburgh Botanic Garden. Yeah, well, we've already seen the bees, and now we're coming into this sort of like mythical fairy tale land. Well, we're up in um, the European woodland area. So we have a sculpture here that was made out of some of the wood, and we got a wolf and a bear. But let's go see what else is up there. So there's a couple little fairy houses, and that's what kids and families love to discover first. And there's a little gnome at that one. So there's fun things just to see. Pittsburgh Botanic Garden is out here in the woods. The majority of it, our 460 acres, has about 65 acres open to the public. And you know what? The best thing that happens here is you just lower your shoulders and relax. I feel like we got to peek inside over here. Oh, here we go. I'm opening up the wrong way. Gosh, Annie, do you want to, can you follow me inside this tiny house? Oh, we've got some books. This is smart. They're in sort of a waterproof container. We could read about wonderful worms in here. And so now we're coming on to a body of water. Right. This is um, called the Lotus Pond, and it's here in the Japanese garden. And it is all about beauty and form follows function, if you will. What people would have seen pre-2014 was a pond that you wouldn't even pay any attention to. Old cars and, you know, refrigerators, whatever, tires, very, what we would say, polluted. Yeah. So Pittsburgh Botanic Garden is um, on abandoned coal mine, our whole site. And uh, of course, coal was harvested out of this area, both with deep mining and strip mining over a good bit of the 1900s up until almost 1960. Miners, when they were harvesting coal, they needed to drain out the extra water that was accumulating in those holes in the ground. Um, and they piped it to the lowest parts of the property, of course, and that would have been here. So when we took over the property uh, in 1988, um, which we leased from Allegheny County, they were so excited that we were going to move forward and do some environmental cleanup on this land. And so one of the things we first had to realize is how do we get some fresh water here, both for planting and watering plants that we may want, but even the greater picture was just the environmental cleanup um, of this watershed. So we took the pipes that came out of the hillside here and have channeled them into um, this tank-like space. If you could picture something like a bathtub, sort of. So sort of where that deck is. That's right. The almost. deck is on top of it. It's only four feet deep or so, and it's full of limestone the size of your fist. Acid mine water comes out of the mines. Still today it does. Yes, 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 yes. Um, comes out and goes there, and through kind of um, passive reaction, um, the acid mine drainage uh, has... Um, it's very acidic. So it's like pH 2, like vinegar. Nothing wow. lives in that. That's why we clean with vinegar. Anyway, um, the aluminum hydroxide is adhered to the molecules in the limestone and and stays there and the water goes, the water molecules go on and it quickly changes the pH of that water now to 7.2 or 8.1 or whatever, put it in that neutral range. And then it filters into the pond that we see down here as well as the ongoing watershed. So well, that's, I mean, it's just wild that a mine that was operating, what, 40, 50 years ago, we're still... I mean, it hasn't operated since then. We're still feeling these effects, and there's still this crazy acidic water coming out of there. That is all over western Pennsylvania, yeah. eastern Pennsylvania, anywhere mining happened. It wasn't until 1977 that federal legislation required mine operators to clean up those sites when they were doing work. So this is all pre-1977. So, so none of that had taken place. Wow. But we then created the walkway through here in the mounded uh, landscape and creating it into a, a Japanese garden, uh, Japanese themed uh, landscape. I mean, so. and now we're seeing, you know, dragonflies are flitting through here. There's all these water lilies blooming. I mean, it's it looks gorgeous. Yep. So this um, is the first one that came online for us. And now here at Pittsburgh Botanic Garden, we have two other uh, acid mine drainage treatment uh, systems. About 25 million gallons a year are filtered out of this site wow. uh, that le go into our natural watershed that goes on to the high River and beyond. Why don't we walk across the stone uh, bridge, if you will. It's not even really a bridge, it's like stepping in the water. 
Oh my gosh, I love this. This is so cool. And you could get close to the lotus plants and you can see the big fat buds. Eventually those will open. So now it looks like we're heading into a more sculptural area of the garden. Yes, this is one of our newest garden areas. It just opened in October last fall, and it is our exhibit garden. And our first exhibit is Carbon Cycle, an Earth Art Exhibit. And this is an installation that will be here for a couple of years with us, probably close to three. And it's the work of Gary Smith. He's a landscape architect and artist from Toronto. You can see the trees up to the right and the trees to the left. And you can see it's kind of a void here in the middle. So this was a strip mine or surface mined site. So the coal was removed in this space that's missing, as I was just describing. This was a project that um, he led mostly from Canada because it was during COVID. We wrapped it up last year. He couldn't get here all of last year. So a lot of FaceTiming and such was good. Our staff and volunteers helped make this happen. Gary likes to work with shapes and, and patterns found in nature. This walkway is kind of like a riverbed, if you will, or a snake, you know? And then there's circles and there's other patterns and mounds. So Gary really wanted to create a piece that was connected to nature. We love the tall grasses that grow here. Yeah, it's, it's wild because it feels like for part of the garden, you're trying to sort of hide and in some ways sort of the signs of the mine that used to be there. I mean, sort of for safety reasons and, and here in some ways, you're sort of showcasing that history. Well, Maybe, but we know that um, it's important for us to talk about the land and the past, all the way from indigenous people to the early settlers on this land, and then up through the farming and, and mining eras of most of the 1900s and through the conversion to what it is today. It's all important. So it looks like we're seeing sort of a, a pile of coal. Yep. So Gary wanted to connect with coal and he said, well, can we get some coal? We said, sure. So that's about 12 tons of coal sitting there. He, he really wants people to interact and think about what happened in their lives or what connections they can have to the site. You know, uh, just being out here in this open space, the wind, the sun, it's quite nice. Yeah. That's really striking. It's also where we're building. You can't see it, but um, the very beginning of it is there where our maintenance, horticulture maintenance and learning landscape uh, center will be in, in a few years also. Gosh, well, Keith, thank you so You're much. Welcome. This is so delightful. You're welcome.